Hi, I'm John Cook. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences, and with me today is Dr. Nick Leeper, our visiting professor from Stanford University, where he is associate professor of medicine and surgery in the Division of Vascular Surgery, where he's also chief of vascular medicine and uh, directs the vascular research there. And uh, we just heard a brilliant presentation by Dr. Leeper. Uh, I wonder, uh, Nick, if you could give us just a nutshell summary of what you talked about today. Well, sure, John. Thanks, and uh, thanks again for the warm invitation to uh, Methodist. It's been a great visit so far. So we just talked about uh, our work uh, looking at a role of a process known as efferocytosis in cardiovascular disease. And Greek for carrying the dead. Yeah, that's right, to, uh, to bury the dead or to carry the dead to the grave. And this is basically the process by which dying cells get recognized for phagocytic clearance. <laughs> And uh, our recent work has suggested that um, patients may develop coronary disease because of a problem with this, and that the cells actually become inedible and are not recognized for clearance by macrophages in the growing plaque. And so we think that part of the reason that the plaques grow and the necrotic core enlarges is because these cells almost have a cloaking device and they can't be recognized for clearance. And so a lot of our work was trying to figure out how to reactivate that process to try to find a way to stimulate the clearance of these cells in a way to shrink the plaque. And indeed, we found a way that we could do this by interrupting what's known as a don't eat me signaling pathway. And this will pretty much trick the immune system into being reactivated and clearing away the, the disease cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and we hope this will turn into a new therapy for humans. Mm -hmm. That's spectacular. So a whole new paradigm of atherosclerosis leading to a new therapeutic avenue. Yeah. Spectacular. You've taken it all the way from the genetics up to uh, phase one clinical trials. So just spectacular. It's what we want to do as physician scientists, right, to, to make those fundamental observations and translate them into something useful. Um, tell us a little bit more about these cells that are, have the cloaking device that are not uh, getting that the body's not able to clear. Um, are these uh, vascular small muscle cells, are they macrophages that have done their job and need to be cleared? Uh, so it's these cells that are accumulating in the plaque, what, what are these cells? Well, you know, we're still trying to work out exactly who it is that's the problem in the growing plaque, but we know for sure that both smooth muscle cells and foamy macrophages uh, have a problem with this don't eat me signaling. And so we think it's actually because of an inflammatory factor known as TNF-alpha in the plaque. Mm -hmm. And this TNF-alpha will drive the expression of a molecule called CD47. CD47 is kind of the granddaddy of the don't eat me molecules. And so when these smooth muscle cells or macrophages are exposed to TNF-alpha, they will turn up their CD47, and then the macrophages can't recognize them. It's uh, almost like they're invisible. You know, it's really interesting because cancers use the same pathway, and that's one of the ways they escape the immune system. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to see a lot of commonality between the two pathways, uh, and indeed, you know, we're able to leverage a lot of the work being done in the oncology field, where they're a few years ahead of us and are trying to actually treat humans with cancer with uh, pro-phagocytic and pro efferocytic mm -hmm. therapy. That's really interesting. So uh, you're saying to, to us that uh, the reason plaques are growing is in part due to a problem with immune surveillance. Mm -hmm. We can't clear the plaques just like a patient can't clear a cancer because of a problem with immune surveillance. The tumor and the plaque have something in common. They're both able to escape normal uh, immune surveillance and uh, disposal. Yes, that's right. I mean, you hear a lot about immuno-oncology and, and we mm -hmm. wonder if there could be immunocardiology as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of really exciting work about the role that dendritic cells play and, and activated macrophages. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think that in addition to imbibing the lipid, you know, it's long been known mm -hmm. that they eat the oxidized LDL, but we think that they have other roles too and that they may be necessary to clear out the debris. Um, mm -hmm. If the cells die and they're not cleared, they undergo secondary necrosis. And mm -hmm. that's known to be very pro-inflammatory and mm -hmm. to promote the vulnerable plaque and plaque rupture, which of course, is the real problem. You know, it's not mm -hmm. a big deal, honestly, if we have plaque buildup over the years. And, you know, almost all yeah. Americans will have that. But it's the feared complication of the plaque rupture that we want to avoid. Is the necrotic core that is within the atherosclerotic plaque, is that necrotic core what, what is resisting clearance? Is that why this necrotic core accumulates in large plaque? That's, that's what, of course, causes the problem when, when those plaques ruptures, that, that necrotic core with mm -hmm. all of the 
tissue factor and highly thrombogenic right. gruel yeah. within that uh, necrotic core. So is this the problem that, uh, of aphrocytosis? We think so. I mm -hmm. mean, in fact, we found that, excuse me, the CD47 is upregulated throughout the diseased blood vessel, but it's particularly upregulated in that necrotic core. So we think there's a local endless loop, actually, where mm -hmm. you have TNF-alpha, and that promotes CD47. That makes the cells inedible. They undergo necrosis, and then that releases more TNF-alpha. So it feeds wow. forward, mm -hmm. and we think we need to interrupt that as a way mm -hmm. to uh, promote clearance. Oh, really exciting, and a whole new therapeutic avenue. Tell us a little bit about uh, the clinical trial that you imagine we'll be doing, hopefully here at Methodist with you, uh, in the near future. Well, that'd be great. You know, we were actually quite lucky because our oncology colleagues have really pushed the envelope here and have actually now humanized these therapies and have taken them through pharmacology and toxicology studies in non-human primates. And believe it or not, they're already in first-in-man phase one trials, both in England uh, and at Stanford. Um, and so we will learn a lot about the safety and hopefully efficacy mm -hmm. of these therapies from those studies. Um, if we find that they are as safe in humans as we think they are based on our mouse and primate mm -hmm. data, uh, I envision that we could very rapidly move into a um, phase two uh, proof of principle study in patients with vascular disease. You know, whether this is an imaging-based study uh, with you know, quantitative uh, plaque burden analysis or perhaps even a cath lab-based study, um, our belief is that we should be able to cool off the, um, mm -hmm. the so-called hot patient those presenting with acute coronary syndrome, and we could uh, hopefully actually induce plaque regression uh, if mm -hmm. the therapy is as effective as we think. Mm -hmm. that's, that's spectacular. Um, just on that point, now that we're getting into human clinical trials, I think it's important to, to mention that you have a uh, con conflict of interest with respect to this. You have a company that you're involved in, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is wonderful, actually. It's something that Stanford does very well, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, to take the research insights and then commercialize those. Because without that uh, intellectual property being commercialized, it uh, just sits in the university. Mm -hmm. So tell us about how you and Irv Weissman are, are uh, commercializing this great insight into yeah. tumor and atherosclerosis. Yeah, well it turns out that, you know, like I said, that the cancer field has really uh, had a head start mm -hmm. on us. and. Uh, now there have been a number of high impact papers showing mm -hmm. that almost all tumors will upregulate these don't eat me molecules mm -hmm. as a way to evade the, the tumor mm -hmm. cytal macrophage. And so I think that there are at least three or four companies that have been started around this concept uh, as a way to, uh, to cure cancer. Um, the technology that was generated at Stanford has been licensed to a company known as 47 Inc. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are the ones that are driving these two human trials with a plan to start additional uh, cancer trials. Mm -hmm. And you know, right now we're trying to decide uh, which other indications we can go for down the road. Um, my hope, of course, is that we can go into the cardiovascular arena as mm -hmm. uh, heart disease remains the leading cause of death both in the U.S. Uh, and across the world. Yeah. Well, we're certainly hoping to work with you and 47 Inc. on that uh, trial. So uh, keep us surprised of, of what's going on. Um, Tell us uh, finally uh, a little bit more about um, how you got interested in vascular disease and became a vascular medicine expert and vascular biologist. Well, I think a lot of my motivation is sitting right here next to me. And uh, um, you know, you recall that after I finished my cardiology training at Stanford, uh, I was doing uh, vascular biology research, but I was working in a heart failure clinic. And mm -hmm. and I really believe uh, by watching people like you that uh, you really miss an opportunity if you don't study every patient that comes to your clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, because of my love for vascular disease, aneurysms, atherosclerosis, et cetera, I realized that I wanted to try to find a way to learn from my patients and hopefully bring back our discoveries to the bedside. And the best way I could do that was by taking care of the vascular path. And so um, you will recall that we worked together on the uh, Vascular Medicine Fellowship at Stanford, uh, received really outstanding training. Uh, mm -hmm. Stanford has a rich history in the field of vascular medicine when you and Victor Zhao came uh, many years ago uh, to start that program. Uh, and now we work hand in hand with our surgeons and we have a very wonderful symbiotic relationship providing what I think is really outstanding care for these people with advanced atherosclerosis, aneurysms, stroke, uh, et cetera. Uh, and the hope is that we can learn from every patient, whether mm -hmm. it's genetics, physiology, or testing our new therapies, 
uh, we want to go from the patient to the bench and then back to the bedside. And that's what we're doing. And you are. That's spectacular. Um, the, um, it's a tough balancing act, isn't it, to do the science, to take care of the patients, to do the teaching. You're also a, a scientific citizen. You do a lot for the American Heart Association. So how do you balance all of those? <laughs> Um, I have a wonderful family that uh, really um, uh, puts up with my travel schedule, but I, I think that we have a, a duty to try mm -hmm. to help the field. And uh, the American Heart Association in particular uh, is near and dear to my heart because they funded my early research. So mm -hmm. uh, as you know, that um, funding rates from the NIH have fallen to all-time lows. Uh, when I finished my training, the NIH R01 rate was uh, single digits, 8%. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if you can't get a grant, uh, you have to go back to the clinics and see more patients. Uh, and the AHA invested in me, and I've seen them invest in other junior investigators. Historically, they've had a very strong commitment to, to the early career individual. More recently, I've, I've been a bit worried about the focus on, on larger projects. I think we need to continue to inv invest in young people. Uh, in particular, but I still feel this debt to the AHA. Mm -hmm. uh, they have pushed public policy, fundraising, uh, and I think are deeply committed to uh, eradicating this disease. And so I'm happy to give back some of my time to them. Well, I certainly made a good investment in you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today and telling us about your exciting new research. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah.